H.P. Lovecraft's The Whisperer in Darkness. Chapter 1. Bear in mind closely that I did not see any actual visual horror at the end. To say that a mental shock was the cause of what I inferred, that last straw which sent me racing out of the lonely Accolade farmhouse and through the wild domed hills of Vermont in a commandeered motor at night, is to ignore the plainest facts of my final experience. Notwithstanding the deep things I saw and heard, and the admitted vividness the impression produced on me by these things, I cannot prove even now whether I was right or wrong in my hideous inference. For after all, Accolade's disappearance establishes nothing. People found nothing amiss in his house, despite the bullet marks on the outside and inside. It was just as though he had walked out casually for a ramble in the hills and failed to return. There was not even a sign that a guest had been there, or that those horrible cylinders and machines had been stored in the study. That he had mortally feared the crowded green hills and endless trickle of books, among which he had been born and reared, means nothing at all either, for thousands are subject to such morbid fears. Eccentricity, moreover, could easily account for his strange acts and apprehensions towards the lost. The whole matter began, so far as I am concerned, with the historic and unprecedented Vermont floods of November 3rd, 1927. I was then, as now, an instructor of literature at Miskatonic University in Arkham, Massachusetts, and an enthusiastic amateur student of New England folklore. Shortly after the flood, amidst the varied reports of hardship, suffering, and organized relief which filled the press, there appeared certain odd stories of things found floating in some of the swollen rivers, so that many of my friends embarked in curious discussions and appealed to me to shed what light I could on the subject. I felt flattered at having my folklore study taken so seriously, and did what I could to belittle the wild, vague tales which seemed so clear an outgrowth of old rustic superstitions. It amused me to find several persons of education who insisted that some stratum of obscure, distorted fact might underlie the rumors. The tales thus brought to my notice came mostly through newspaper cuttings, though one yarn had an arl source and was repeated to a friend of mine in a letter from his mother in Hardwick, Vermont. The type of thing described was essentially the same in all cases, though there seemed to be three separate instances involved, one connected with the Winooski River near Montpelier, another attached to the West River in Wyndham County beyond Newfane, and a third centering in the Passumpsic in Caledonia County above Lindenville. Of course, many of the stray items mentioned other instances, but on analysis they all seemed to boil down to these three. In each case, country folk reported seeing one or more very bizarre and disturbing objects in the surging waters that poured down from the unfrequented hills and there was a widespread tendency to connect these sites with a primitive, half-forgotten cycle of whispered legend, which old people resurrected for the occasion. What people thought they saw were organic shapes, not quite like any they had ever seen before. Naturally, there were human bodies washed along by the streams in that tragic period, but those who described these strange shapes felt quite sure that they were not human, despite some superficial resemblances in size and general outline. Nor, said the witnesses, could they have been any kind of animal known to them all. They were pinkish things, about five feet long, with crustaceous bodies bearing vast pairs of dorsal fins, or membranous wings, and several sets of articulated limbs, and with a sort of convoluted ellipsoid, covered with multitudes of very short antennae, where a head would ordinarily be. It was really remarkable how closely the reports from different sources tended to coincide, though the wonder was lessened by the fact that the old legends shared at one time throughout the hill country furnished a morbidly vivid picture which might well have colored the imaginations of all the witnesses concerned. It was my conclusion that such witnesses, in every case naive and simple backwards folk, had glimpsed the battered and bloated bodies of human beings or farm animals in the whirling currents, and it allowed the half-remembered folklore to invest these pitiful objects with fantastic attributes. The ancient folklore, while cloudy, evasive, and largely forgotten by the present generation, was of a highly singular character and obviously reflected the influence of still earlier Indian tales. I knew it well, though I had never been in Vermont, through the exceedingly rare monograph of Eli Davenport, which embraces material orally obtained prior to 1839 among the oldest people of the state. This material, moreover, closely coincided with tales which I had personally heard from the elderly rustics in the mountains of New Hampshire. Briefly summarized, it hinted at a hidden race of monstrous beings which lurked somewhere among the remoter hills, in the deep woods of the highest peaks and the dark valleys where streams trickled from unknown sources. These beings were seldom glimpsed, 
but evidence of their presence were reported by those who had ventured farther than usual up the slopes of certain mountains or into certain deep, steep-sided gorges that even the wolves shunned. There were queer footprints or claw prints in the mud of brook margins and barren patches and curious circles of stones, with the grass around them worn away, which did not seem to have been placed or entirely shaped by nature. There were, too, certain caves of problematical depth in the sides of the hills, with mouths closed by boulders in a manner scarcely accidental, and with more than an average quarter of the queer prints leading both towards and away from them, if indeed the direction of these prints could be justly estimated. And worst of all, there were the things which adventurous people had seen very rarely in the twilight of the remotest valleys, and the dense perpendicular woods above the limits of normal hill climbing. It would have been less uncomfortable if the stray accounts of these things had not agreed so well. As it was, nearly all the rumours had several points in common, averring that the creatures were a sort of huge light red crab, with many pairs of legs and with two great bat-like wings in the middle of the back. They sometimes walked on all their legs, and sometimes on the hindmost pair only, using the others to convey large objects of indeterminate nature. On one occasion, they were spied in considerable numbers, a detachment of them wading along a shallow woodland watercourse, three abreast, in evidently disciplined formation. Once a specimen was seen flying, launching itself from the top of a bold, lonely hill at night, and vanishing in the sky after its great flapping wings had been silhouetted an instant against the full moon. These things seemed content on the whole to let mankind alone, though they were at times held responsible for the disappearance of venturesome individuals especially persons who built houses too close to certain valleys or too high up on certain mountains. Many localities came to be known as inadvisable to settle in, a feeling persisting long after the cause was forgotten. People would look up at some of the neighboring mountain precipices with a shudder, even when not recalling how many settlers had been lost and how many farmhouses burnt to ashes on the lower slopes of those grim green sentinels.